Chip Gibson swing. This is gonna be a home run. Unbelievable! I don't believe what I just saw. Hello, I'm Chris Fowler for Sports Century. Ebbets Field, May 28, 1952. The next morning, Willie Mays reported to the U.S. Army. The Korean War was raging, and no one knew when he'd return. So the Brooklyn crowd, who should have hated him for leading the Giants to a pennant over the Dodgers just the year before, cheered his final at bat. When the game ended, all four umpires cut across the diamond to say goodbye to Willie. Then he disappeared into the clubhouse, while organist Gladys Gooding played I'll See You in My Dreams, the Say Hey Kid was everybody's favorite. I remember my father taking me to the polo grounds. I remember sitting on my father's shoulders to see over the heads of the people in front of us. I remember what it felt like and smelled like. I remember my dad saying, there's Willie Mays. Look, there's Willie Mays. Willie Mays batting at 345, the National League batting champion. Here's the guy that a lot of the people here this afternoon have come to see. When he roamed the outfield, he was the free spirit in the outfield. Willie was the wind-up toy whose batteries never died. He would do things that you really can't explain. You'd have to see him in a game situation. Going from first to third on a ground ball to shortstop. Scoring from second base on a sacrifice fly as a matter of routine. His territory was from foul line to foul line, just stay out of his way. Fresco Thompson, the general manager for the Brooklyn Dodgers, said, Willie Mays' glove, where triples go to die. Wow. And now, fans, this is Jimmy Dudley speaking to you again from the Mutual Radio booth. And today we're all set to bring you the first game of the 1954 World Series. Game one of the 1954 World Series. Tied at two in the eighth, Cleveland had runners on first and second with nobody out. The pitcher was Don Little. The batter, of course, was Vic Wirtz. Situation was important. And there were Mays out in center field. There's a long drive way back in center field. Way back, back. He really ran like a pass receiver heading for the ball. And nobody thought he was going to catch the ball. Nobody. As I'm running, I'm not worrying about catching the ball. My biggest problem was, how am I going to get this ball back into the infield? If I didn't catch the ball, the guy on second is going to score. The guy on first is going to score. Way back, back, it is. It's the instinct. He knew the situation. He knew the game score. He knew the men on base. The amazing thing about the catch is not the catch. It's the presence of mind to make the catch and whirl and make the throw. It was essential, Willie. It was the impossible play that he made because of this, this tremendous talent he had for doing more than he was capable of doing. That catch was the defining moment of the 1954 Giants. It was the defining moment of the 1954 World Series. And it was the defining moment of Willie Mays publicly because now they had a reference point to say, do you remember when? If his catch proved historic, it was not necessarily his best. With the play against Brooklyn three years earlier, the rookie sensation provided a hint of things to come. There was a play in an afternoon game at the Polo Grounds, and Billy Cox was on third base. And Perillo hit a ball into right center field. It was almost in right field. Here comes this kid, Mays, uh, like a streak makes a headlong catch. He was parallel with the ground when he caught the ball. Then, in an unbelievable move, he hit the ground, rolled over, his hat flew off, and he threw just blind. And Cox was out by three good strides. Charlie Dresden was a manager at Dodgers, and they went in and asked him, the reporters asked him what he thought about that after the game. And Charlie said, I'd like to see the son of a do it again. He seemed to do it all the time. 12 gold gloves, almost 2,000 RBI. The first player to hit 300 home runs and steal 300 bases. For 22 seasons, Willie's genius flashed from every aspect of the game. Willie was probably one of the most cerebral ball players uh, that ever excelled at the game. He had everything figured out. He would know everything that every one of his pitchers was able to throw and likely to throw and win. So he was getting a head start 
on every ball he went after. He could take his glove and move you this way and then all of a sudden put a hand up to stop you or move you this way and put up a hand to stop you and then hit the ball right to you. It's like he knew where they were going to hit the ball. I didn't need a book. I had it up in my mind what I had to do, what he's done, how he's going to pitch. I knew all that. Many, many times a pitcher would release the ball and he could see the flight of the ball. And if he thought it was going to bounce in the dirt, he would take off before the ball actually went into the dirt. Willie had an inventive way of playing baseball, just stretching it, stretching baseball a little bit beyond its limits. He did it in every way. He had a little fancy basket catch that he made, and that was part of his trademark. Willie explained very carefully why it made sense to him. Because if you catch the ball like this, now you have to bring the home run all the way around like this in order to throw. But if you catch it here, you're halfway back with that throw already. He was a five-point player. He could hit with power. He could hit for average. He had a great arm. He was an outstanding fielder and had great running speed. To watch him take off like a big-ass bird from first base on a steal or something, he got great jumps. There was a lot of cob in him on the base pass, and I always thought that Willie defined for my generation the way the game should be played in terms of aggressiveness and toughness and a little nastiness. Drysdale said you got to knock him down and you throw him sliders. I think the first time I tried that, I got two strikes on him and I buzzed him. He ended up hitting a double. Then the next pitch was a wild pitch. He rounded third, kept coming home. I'm covering home. He comes in, spikes high, starts to slide, and drops and slides around me and says, I could have got you, kid. Just remember that when you come high and inside. Probably the best ball player I've ever seen. I mean, you take everything into consideration. It seemed like Willie never made a mistake. The ball sounded a little different than it did off any other bat. I never hit a ball in St. Louis when I was managing the Giants. And I hit the light tower behind the scoreboard. And he came down to me and he said, Skipper, I hit that ball so hard it scared me. There was one at bat, Mays hit a home run off of me and it hit the scoreboard. You know, I think he hit it with one hand, I'm not sure. And he had one attribute that people didn't realize. He could catch anybody's fastball from the mound barehanded. So he would bet you whatever you wanted to bet that you could stand on the mound, throw as hard as you wanted to, and he would catch it barehanded. Hey! May's originality and strength of character were reassuring in a world teetering on the edge of integration. We're talking to a nation that still hasn't made up its mind about a lot of things in terms of race, and particularly whether it's going to accept Afro-American heroes. Willie Mays made it easy for them. This was a guy who not only derived so much enjoyment from playing the game, but people derived that similar type of enjoyment from watching him play it. Jackie Robinson integrated the game of baseball, just racially. But Willie Mays came along, and he integrated the game stylistically. He was that generation of black athletes after Robinson who were now free, who were just free to play ball. But nobody was going to throw black cats at you. In fact, they were gonna reward you for it because that's precisely what the game needed. He wasn't a polished professional. He was a kid playing baseball, man. He was out there every day and it looked like he was having the best time of anybody in the ballpark. You could identify with Willie. He was doing what you would like to do yourself if, if you could. Photographers would follow him. and They'd find him after a game playing stickball in the streets of Harlem with teenagers. Willie was all style. You could compare him to uh, Cab Calloway. This is a guy whose creases had edges you could cut your finger on and two-tone shoes. Willie was slick. Willie was sharp. Willie had tapered pants. He used to take them to the tailor. He had the perfect uniform. We had eye black to be like Willie Mays. We wore wristbands to be like Willie Mays. We used to try to have our hats fly off our heads as we run around the base. Willie had uh, charisma like no one else. And plus he had the name, Willie. I mean, just the way he walked, the way he caught the ball. Everything was his own style. The one thing that struck me about Willie Mays as a catcher sitting behind him was that he had his nails buffed. And I'd never seen a man with buff nails. In the 1950s, New York was the center of the baseball universe. It was also home to three distinguished center fielders, each with a following more passionate than the next. No city ever had three major league teams in the same town in, uh, in the modern era. And now, in this capital of baseball towns, here comes the capital ballplayers, Willie, Mickey, and the Dukes. It's more than a song. 
Willie McKee and the Duke was your way of life. You could get into a fist fight over whether it was Mays or Mantle or Snyder. I think even more than, than, than the dispute among people as to which one was the best is how proud New Yorkers were that we had the three best, that no other city had even anyone in the top three. We were playing over in the polo grounds and I walked up by the batting cage and that particular year I had a little better batting average than Willie. And I said, Willie, I got you by eight points. And he said, yeah, but I got two more home runs than you got. I remember being at a banquet and they were all there. And Mickey Mantle got up and said that the best center fielder played for the Giants. New York embraced Willie. Even Dodger and Yankee fans conceded that he was not a bad baseball player. He could do no wrong as long as he was in New York. Alabama was the most complete form of segregation to exist on the globe outside of Johannesburg, South Africa. That was the world of Willie Mays. You go downtown to a little bus station, you see signs saying white waiting, colored waiting. There was a tremendous amount of fear. It was two worlds, one white and, and the other one being black. It was a world we were born into and we, we sort of knew our places and Willie grew up in that world and I thought, I, I think he, he, he fit in well. Born May 6, 1931 in Westfield, Alabama, Willie Howard Mays shows signs of athletic greatness upon delivery. When Willie was born, the doctor took one look at his hands and he said, I never saw hands like that because he had no wrists. He had huge hands and they just came down from a forearm and then sprang into five fingers. His mother and father both were athletes. His mother was very close to being a world-class track athlete. The father was very, very close to Willie. He said Willie started walking like almost six months old. And what he had done to, to test out Willie, he put him between two chairs, okay, and then put a baseball on one, and he said, get the ball, chase the ball, just to make Willie move and grab the ball. My mother uh, remarried, uh, and she had 11 kids. Uh, my father had two. My mother died at a very young age, 34, and my father and I lived together. I think that's really where I began to understand about sports. We lived close by the ballpark, and uh, I used to play in the field with my father and everything. It would be wrong to say that he grew up in dire poverty, but he didn't. His father worked for a Tennessee coal, iron, and steel. His father could pick up the little change by playing semi-pro ball. I was very fortunate to understand the game at a very early age. My father would often talk to me about baseball, but I learned the game, I think, most of all on my own by playing with, I guess, older people. I learned the game very quickly. But baseball was just his summer game. In his teens, he was a star for all seasons. He was all county and on our basketball team, our leading scorer in high school. He was a quarterback for Fairfax Industrial School in Alabama, an all-black school. I said, how far could you throw a jump pass? He said, about 60 yards. And uh, he said, Don, that was my best sport. But nobody would have me because you could not have a black quarterback. So on the authority of Willie Mays, Willie was a better football player than a baseball player. Forsaking the dreams of the NFL, Mays signed to play for the Birmingham Black Barons of the Negro Leagues in 1948. He was just 16. I had to stay in school, so I played Saturday and Sunday when school was in. When school was out, I would go on the road with them. Piper Davis, he was a manager. He talked to my father, made sure that I had money on the road, made sure that I didn't spend the money. Whatever I got, I had to send home. Uh, he was like a, a second father to me when I was coming along. Fly ball, pretty deep fly ball, hit the center field. Willie caught the ball, I had my man tag up, go home. The ball was waiting for him. I said, after this season, somebody got to sign Willie. And you look over in the right field stand, which is where whites would have to sit at the black ball games, there'd be a lot of white fans. And they started coming when Willie Mays started playing. 
I think he was very comfortable with his race in the South. He was a star in the Negro community, and I think that's where he felt his kinship. I don't think he was terribly concerned about integration, uh, um, you know, perhaps to his shame. Three years after Jackie Robinson broke the racial barrier, the New York Giants were smart enough to spot Willie's exceptional talent, signing him in 1950. Mays batted 353 with Class B Trenton. The following year, they put him with Minneapolis. But Willie got on the phone with uh, Leo DeRocha. DeRocha said, I want you to come up to the major leagues and play center field for me. Willie said, I can't do that. He says, I can't hit that kind of pitching. DeRocha says, what are you hitting now? He said, 477. He says, do you think you can hit 270 for me? And I said, yeah, he said, I could do that. He said, well, then get up here. joined the Giants on the road. Willie's arrival was in Philadelphia, and we were just finishing batting practice. And he walked on the field, and Leo said, let him have the last five minutes. And uh, Willie went in, he popped one up, and hit a ground ball, hit a foul ball. And then he hit a rocket that hit the upper deck in left field. And then he hit a rocket that hit the upper deck in center field. Then he hit a rocket that hit the scoreboard in right field, and everything stopped. He hit five balls in the upper deck. That probably was the moment I realized he was, he was something special. Leo came to me and said, uh, said, Molly, I think we got something here. He said, I'll work with him, and you work with him. He said, I think he'll make us some money. I said, I think you're right, Leo. But big league pitching, especially the curveball, wasn't batting practice, and Mays sputtered. Hitless in his first three games, the edgy 20-year-old sought counsel from left fielder Monty Irvin, a veteran of the Negro Leagues. They ruined him with Monty, and there were times, Monty told us, when Willie would get out of his bed, crawl in bed with Monty, and go to sleep in Monty's arms because he needed the strength and the assurance that Monty could give him. This was his anchor, really. This was the guy he could ask any question he wanted to ask. This is the guy who would say to him, listen, Willie, you don't do it that way. I'm sure that Leo had spoken to Irvin about you got to be a mentor to this kid, and he was totally protected. Despite Irvin's encouragement, Mays continued to nosedive, garnering just one hit, a homer, in his first 26 at-bats. Finally, he broke. Willie Mays is going hitless. Coach comes to DeRocher and says, you better do something while he's out there. He's crying. Yeah, I am in the clubhouse crying and, you know, I want to go back to Minneapolis. And so Leo came in and uh, uh, he said to me, hey, don't worry, you're my son of Philo. You just go out and catch the ball, we'll get for you. He was like a scared kid. He, uh, he felt out of his element there in the New York scene. Uh, but I know this, that uh, Leo believed in him and kept his arm around him. So did many of his teammates in a time-honored dugout tradition. Willie races over, reaches up and catches a ball in his bare hand. and comes into the dugout, waiting for the plaudits of his teammates. They're stone dead silent. So he walks down the length of the dugout and looks in, and in his high squeaky voice, he says to DeRocha, Leo, Leo, I just made a great catch. And DeRocha looks up and says, Willie, I didn't see it. Do it again next inning. He was the baby on the ball club. Uh, they played a lot of jokes on him. And you got to remember also, we're talking 1951, and, and blacks were still treated in baseball very paternalistically. And Leo, who went out of his way to protect Willie from a variety of things, uh, did not do him any favors. He spoiled him. He prevented him from having to face things for himself, issues that you face growing up and growing up as a ball player. The Say Hey Kid image was both real and manufactured. It was what Willie then could hide behind to not display his true depth and true intelligence. It created an image that he began to live. 
in a way, I think DeRocher gave fans a false impression of uh, Willie. He gave the impression that, uh, that this was, in fact, a, a child man. I don't see Willie as ever having uh, been childlike in the, in the slightest. He was athletically mature and, uh, and in many ways socially mature. And suddenly the Giants say, look at this man-child. They say, gee, we can't leave him alone in the big ceiling. And they're, they're making preparations. You're watching where he lives. You're watching what he does. You're watching what... And he doesn't care. What time is the game? Fine. That's when you want me there. I'll go there. That's all he's concerned with. DeRocher's strategy paid off. Mays finished the season hitting 274, playing a key role as the Giants mounted the greatest comeback in National League history. So he went back and began to pick it up and, and became the rookie of the year. If uh, Leo hadn't supported him there in, in those early games, uh, that uh, Willie might have had a different career. You never know. After that very bleak start, he got his game together, and the Giants uh, rode his back throughout the summer of 1951 and on to the eventual uh, pennant playoff with the Dodgers. In the deciding playoff game, Mays was on deck with the Giants trailing 4-2 in the ninth. I was so scared, and uh, my, my fear wasn't hitting. My fear was, well, they're going to walk Bobby, and Leo's going to pinch it for me. Back and throw. served most of the next two seasons as a Korean War draftee. And upon his return in 1954, he began playing his best baseball. But by 1956, his twin father figures, DeRocher and Irvin, were no longer with the team. Alone and unprotected, Mays faced life as a black superstar in a country divided by race. When Willie was young, he was being criticized for not being militant enough on racial questions. I don't think Mays was as aware of his times and his place. He was not someone who was giving a lot of thought to this world or to the history or to the situation. Mays was who he was. He was a great ball player. And to ask him to have been more, I think, was, was beyond what he was necessarily qualified to do. He's not dumb. He's not unaware. He's not interested in the rest of the world. He wasn't a militant. He wasn't an anti-militant. He didn't want to negotiate. He wanted to play baseball. That's all he wanted to do. Following the 1957 season, the landscape of New York baseball was severely altered. There are friends of mine who believe that the decay of Western civilization began with the Dodgers and Giants moving to the West Coast, and, and just as Athens lost some of its monuments, we lost Willie Mays. When he was asked to leave with the Giants to go to San Francisco, he was shocked, practically destroyed. I know it bothered Willie, even though he didn't publicly say so. It had to, because in New York, Willie was the Giants. And he got to San Francisco, he was just another ball player. The so-called rivalry between San Francisco and New York is entirely on the part of San Francisco. So when Willie came out here with all the reputation and adulation he had acquired in New York, it, it was almost resented. The fans of San Francisco considered him New York's Willie Mays. He never was adopted the way he was by the fans in New York. I think the advance publicity was, uh, you think you've seen uh, great baseball players, well, you haven't seen anything until you've seen Willie Mays. Now that, in small doses, is fine, but it actually uh, was irritating. Irritating to the sensibilities of uh, knowledgeable baseball fans. You know, we'll decide how good he is once we see him play. There is no city with a tradition to match San Francisco. And the tradition was that uh, there was no such thing as a black ball player, but especially a black ball player who was being rated above DiMaggio. Joe DiMaggio had grown up in San Francisco, and the Pacific Coast League team had been uh, very popular since the turn of the century. Here's Willie coming in with all the startling ability that he had, and they made it a little tough for him. Even the field of play seemed against Mays. The polo grounds, short left and right field porches were replaced by a stadium harboring the foulest weather in the majors. No question about it, I think Calistec Park hurt Willie Mays an awful lot. It blew continuously from left to right. I always wondered how many home runs Willie Mays may have hit had he played in some of those ballparks that it maybe would have favored a right-hand hitter. 
if Mays had been playing the same ballpark that Hank Aaron had been playing, and Mays would have broken that record many times, I think. When Mays received few plaudits for hitting a career best 347 in his inaugural season, he should have gotten the hint. He would never satisfy the fans in San Francisco. But Willie encountered a far more serious rejection. When he got there, he encountered something he had never encountered in New York, and that was racism. The house that Willie wanted to buy, neighbors started protesting. And the first week that Mays has lived there, a brick was thrown through the window. Almost immediately, he had competition out in San Francisco with Cepeda and McCovey. And there may have been the sense that, well, what do we need New York's hero when we have our own? Orlando was very outgoing. He was single at that time. He was in the top nightclubs dancing and, you know, very visible. And Mays was not. I was at the right place at the right time. I was very fortunate to be able to start doing well. I was very surprised that Willie resented me. He never gave any outward signs of being hurt or anything like that, but he became a little recluse. A lot of baseball writers thought that he was kind of snobbish, but he wasn't. It was Willie Mays a very bashful man when he came west. And Willie was introverted his whole career. People thought, you know, he was, he was sullen or of course he didn't like people, but that wasn't the case. He stayed to himself. And what happens then is that Willie goes into a little bit of a shell. But suddenly, he's this eternal child playing baseball. Look at the way I can play this game. And people are looking at another guy. Gone were the friendly pepper games with DeRocher and Irvin. One of the last links to New York, Mays was cast by the local press as the elder statesman. I think it, some of the fun went out of it in part because he had become a grizzled veteran. I remember, he started playing pro ball at the highest level available to him at the age of 17. And a lot of the flair and a lot of the verve and a lot of those delightful mannerisms were gone. I remember Willie staying in his hotel room, ordering room service, and going to the ballpark. He was baseball and nothing else. I don't know of any player on the Giants in those years who could be described as Willie's uh, closest friend. After uh, they both retired, uh, McCovey and Mays are virtually neighbors. And uh, McCovey told me once, he said, I, I never hear from Mays. Adding to Willie's isolation was the tough Marine Corps style of Giants manager Bill Rigney, who had taken over for DeRocher in 1956. Rigney didn't have that bedside manner with Willie that uh, Leo had, and there might have been a little problem there. It was just a different relationship. Willie had lost the manager who doted on him. Rigney didn't do that. Rigney had kids in his lineup. He had to, uh, he had to dote on them. I couldn't be Leo to him, because uh, it was only that relationship was his and uh, alone. But in 1962, Mays experienced a renaissance as the Giants battled for the pennant. On September 12th, though, he collapsed in the dugout, missing three critical games. He played with such intensity that he would get tired. And you know, he just collapsed. We were playing a series in Cincinnati, it was real hot, and he was so exhausted that at home play, it looked like he wanted to almost lay down. He almost collapsed. We put him in the hospital after the game. We were definitely concerned about his health. I think that those who knew him uh, best uh, felt that with this kind of stress that physical problems were uh, inevitable. I think that they were definitely a result of emotional problems. Rumors swirled that his physical problems stemmed from a marriage that was under a cloud almost before it started six years earlier in New York. Willie didn't tell anybody he was marrying Marguerite. Willie Mays comes into the locker room and says, guys, I got married. And everybody says, dude, this is terrific, Willie, sensational. Oh, congratulations. Yeah, I think you know her. I married Marguerite. And then there's kind of a silence. And when he walked away, one guy said, who's going to tell him? Willie married her. We were still young, 25. His good friend, Monty Irvin, said, Willie, she's not the girl for you. You know, I don't think you should marry her. But Willie was smitten by her. I think that was his first really true love. He was married to a gal who uh, the United States meant couldn't print the money as fast as she could spend it. He travels. He hears stories about how she's running around, how she's drinking. He hears the names of people that she's drinking with. The papers insist that he smacked her around a little bit. And it got worse and worse and worse. And he had no one to talk to about it. And so it ate at him. 
My mom isn't the kind of person that, that anybody would necessarily feel sorry for. She was from a bigger city, more socially prepared than he was. So if anybody, you know, I would be concerned about going through that whole thing, it would be him. In late 1962, Mays revealed that he and Marguerite had separated. There would be an ugly divorce proceeding that included a custody battle for their four-year-old son. I guess he was fell in love with Marguerite and they married her. Later on, he said he was sorry. I believe that he, he believed in the concept of romantic love. And so he threw himself into this thing. A big house, this is my woman, we're gonna have a child. I'm sure he wanted to do more in terms of, of our relationship. You know, the great demands on his time. I don't know how that works. Those are tough choices between his son and a, and a you know, a, a world. May's divorce in 63 left a deep and visceral cut. Willie lost his wife, his son, his fortune, and what was left of his celebrated innocence. He was very unto himself. He didn't want the world to worry about him. It was his problem. He would take care of it. You never heard him ever mention uh, his, anything about his marriage in the clubhouse or financial problems he had. It just seemed to me that no matter what was going on in his private life, once he put the uniform on that said Giants, boy, he was a, it was an, another world. It was his world now. At 31, Mays could still freeze the opposition with his bat. On the final day of the 1962 season, he hit a homer that forced a playoff against Los Angeles. Never had in uh, a professional champion in any sport. The town went absolutely wild over that event. There were 50,000 people to greet the team at the airport coming back from Los Angeles. It was comparable to VJ Day. Everyone was a hero, but Willie was the hero of heroes. And I think probably at that point, Mays realized, hey, this is not bad. In 1965, Mays won his second MVP award after hitting 52 home runs. In the history of baseball, no one has ever hit 50 or more home runs twice, 10 years apart, except Willie Mays. Two and delivery, and Mays sends another one. Tell it, bye-bye, baby. Willie Mays has tied a record, four home runs in a game. Now there's five, five, baby. Number 512 for Willie Mays. Mays hits it on the next game. Willie Mays! After his playing life merged into history, Mays began to reclaim his life off the field. Manager Herman Franks helped him stabilize his finances. And Herman knew Willie was having a tough time financially, but at that time, Herman Franks took him under his arm and, and, and put him in the right investments. I just wanted to help Willie. I wanted to see him do well. Uh, he was such a good guy, and I didn't want to see him end up broke. In spite of his burdens, Mays found a way to excel. By the end of the 60s, he was named Player of the Decade, and by 1971, he had a new role on the team. That year was the hottest year that I played because I had played so long and so much that every time I got a day off, I couldn't go home. I had to stay here, go in the bullpen, Make sure that the guy positioned himself, make sure that the center fielder positioned himself in the way that I felt that he should be done. That's rewarding, but that's hard. Even in the end, when his skills were eroding, and the best thing he could do for the Giants was get on base, not push runners around or hit home runs, he learned how to walk. He led the league in walks, led the league in on base percentage, which he'd never done in his career. In 1971, he started out like gangbusters. And through June, he was hitting over 300. He'd set a National League record for runs scored. Uh, and then all of a sudden, he just went downhill. With Mays struggling in the outfield, manager Charlie Fox brought him in to play first base, where Willie was not at home. Well, he just had so much pride in uh, uh, you know, you could see it in his performance on the field and see it in the clubhouse that, that he didn't have that smile on his face or the jolly Willie Mays that he was in the years before that. I think he played at such a high standard of performance for himself that this was a machine that was likely to break down. 
The hardest thing for a ball player to do is to look natural and graceful and unmindful of the obligations of performing before a crowd. What's more difficult than something you were once great at and you know what to do and you can't do it? It has to be the, you know, the worst thing in the world. The worst thing in the world. In May of 1972, the Giants traded Mays to the Mets. For New Yorkers, it was a chance to see their hero again. For Willie, who returned with his second wife, May, it was a chance to reignite an old flame. First game back, as the fates would have it, the opponent is the San Francisco Giants, the team that didn't want him. And with the score tied 4-4, Willie comes up, hits a solo home run, it sticks as the margin, and it's as if God had said, we owe you this one, Willie. But May's strikes of thunder were rare. Two weeks before the Mets won the 1973 pennant, the scarred 42-year-old warrior stood before a full house at Shea Stadium. Ladies and gentlemen, Willie Mays! I never feel that I would ever quit baseball. But as you know, it always come a time for someone to get out. The kids over here, the way they are playing, tells me one thing. Willie, say goodbye to America. Thank you very much. There's a time uh, you got to quit, you know, when you know it. And uh, I guess Willie knew it to himself. The day before the World Series, Willie came down the runway, and as he came up into the dugout, there were probably 100 media members waiting for him. OK, Willie, what's it like to be back? And he looked around and he said, I just want to get it over. There's a smash in the left center. Willie Mays over. And it gets high. Willie Mays stumbling again as he did on the bases. To see the great Willie Mays had trouble with two fly balls in one game probably never happened before in his long career. It was embarrassing to see him out there. I mean, you felt for the man. This is the thing that. Willie's tank was on empty when he hit New York, and everything he did to help bring that really wretched Mets team all the way to the World Series was remarkable, but it reflected strain. And you saw Willie Mays literally at his knees pleading for an out call to be turned into a save call, and you knew it was time for this man to retire, and not only that, it was past the time for him to retire. And I think that's always going to be the example of people hanging on a little bit longer than they should have. Not everyone can leave baseball with the panache of Ted Williams, hitting a home run in your home ballpark and walking away. But it was not a favor to Willie Mays to have him play in a way that people would have that as their last memory of it. But that fades. And what abides and endures is the picture of the young Mays in center field. Mays stayed on with the Mets as a part-time coach. But the pull of his glorious past was too strong. He told me the pain was so great. He said he'd come to, to the stadium and put on his uniform. About the third or fourth inning, he wanted to play so badly, it hurt him so badly, he'd go to dugout change and leave. They made him a public relations man, and that wasn't Willie Mays. I think Willie Mays could have managed. Uh, he knew the game. He knew how to play the game. He'd played it better than anybody else but nobody offered it to him. In 1979, Commissioner Bowie Kuhn delivered an ultimatum to Mays, give up his part-time job at Bally's Casino or give up baseball. In need of money, Willie chose the better paying position and was suspended indefinitely. The episode was just another bitter pill and what Mays perceives is a fading legacy. I think Willie definitely has the feeling that he's underappreciated and I think it hurts him. He tends to withdraw to start with, so I think that that just makes it even worse. Willie is bitter because he's not looked upon as the top player. Joe DiMaggio sort of took a little bit of that away from him. Ted Williams is taking a little bit of that. Aaron has started to take some of that away from him. He feels like he's not getting his just dues for what he accomplished and what he did in baseball. Willie is a very self-satisfied man. He's got a lovely wife. May is a very charming lady. He's got a happy life, and he's doing the things he likes to do, but he's so introspective, and it's so difficult. If he's got problems, woes, it's very difficult to get it out of him. 
willing is the type of individual that will give you all the help that you want. All you have to do is ask him. He has very traditional values and ideals that are from that era. He very much believes in being stand-up, not because you're supposed to or not because, you know, it's going to further your career or put more money in your pocket, but because he believes in those things. Maybe there's something authentic in, in being cranky and saying, I've given you plenty. If you want me to have an act, if you want me to meet you halfway, why should I? There are a million of you. Think of what effort that requires for me always to meet you halfway when there are so many of you. That's not fair. No one really knows Willie Mays. The public doesn't. The press doesn't. He's, he's, he's as much a mystery as DiMaggio was. He wanted to emulate DiMaggio on the field, and he wanted to emulate him off the field. DiMaggio was revered for protecting his privacy and doing things his own way, and Mays got a lot of flack. Joe DiMaggio was voted in 1969 as the greatest living ball player, and I asked him his opinion on who the greatest player that he had ever seen was. And unhesitatingly, he answered Willie Mays. 660 home runs, 24 all-star games, the greatest player of all time, Willie Mays. I know in my own feeling, in my own heart, I was thinking, whoa, man, he's got to understand how much these people really, really love him. Willie Mays' legacy will go on forever. Willie Mays at his best not only could do everything, he made you smile watching him do it. He reminded you of why it's such a great game. He was like a little kid playing ball at the highest possible level of a grown man's skill. Forever, Willie Mays would be the young kid with the smile and giants across here. Willie Mays will be the maker of impossible catches, the stealer of impossible bases, the collector of impossible hits, the winner of impossible victories. And that legacy will never fade. Willie Mays often expressed his genius in ways the fans couldn't see. He would sometimes intentionally miss a pitch that he liked early in the game so that the pitcher might serve it up again when the game was on the line. Another ploy was to occasionally pull up at first base when he could have easily stretched the hit into a double. The reason? Willie McCovey was up next, and Mays didn't want the pitcher to have the option of walking the feared slugger. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.